I have a secret uh, that most of you aren't aware of, and that is that my name isn't actually Drew. I mean, my name is Drew. That's what everyone calls me by. That is what your name is. But what I mean by that is my legal name isn't Drew. Drew is just a small part of my middle name. It's, it's half of it. My full name is Michael Andrew Ketchum, and I've never, ever gone by Michael. It's always been Drew. And, and that came about because of my parents. My mom, she really, really wanted me to be named after my dad, whose first name is Michael. And, and, and so uh, she just kind of wanted me to carry on his legacy of who he is and was. And, and, and that's a great thing. But my dad was very adamant that he did not want me to be a junior. He was, he was so against that idea. And so he said, yes, you can name uh, me Dr- Michael for my first name, but we have to have different middle names. He, he did not want a Michael Sr. and a Michael Jr. And, and Drew came about because with my first name being Michael, they had to come up with a name they would call me, and they loved Drew. They both just loved the sound of Drew, thought it was a great name. Uh, but for some reason, they thought Andrew would be a better, maybe it's just the flow, Michael, Andrew, Ketchum. Um, and these two names... <clears throat> They have really cool meanings. The first one, Michael, means who is like God, but not in that statement sense, but in a question, like who is like God, and there's kind of an unspoken nobody. Nobody is like God. And then Andrew means manly or brave, which was a great name, clearly fitting for me. Um, But really, my name doesn't carry any special meaning beyond just being named after my dad. Uh, But my name has been a huge headache, particularly as a teenager. Uh, See, my name meant that every beginning of the year, every change in the semester, junior high and high school, because you've been a new class, uh, that I would be kind of put on the spot. It would draw attention to me. Because every first day of a class, when you go in and they do kind of that roll call, they go through the class class list and they say, you know, each person, you got to say present. Well, inevitably it would have to come to me and I would be ready. I'd be ready even though I don't go by Michael. I knew despite the fact that we would tell the administration I go by Drew, they would call me Michael Ketchum. And I would say here present. And then they'd ask the question, do you want to go by Michael or Mike or maybe sometimes Mikey? And I would have to say, well, actually I go by Drew. And most teachers, they didn't care. They were totally fine with that. I might get the occasional time. How do you arrive at Drew from Michael? And then I would explain the, the you know, they, my parents just like that. And I'm named after my dad. <clears throat> but two times during my, my seventh through 12th grade years, uh, there were two teachers that just were not having that. They were not interested in this idea that I would be Drew when my first name was Michael. And so when I would respond, I'd like to go by Drew, they gave me something like, yeah, I'm not really interested in your nonsense this morning. I just want to know what you want to be called by, Michael or Mike. And in one particular instance, this created just a huge distraction. It ended up with like four or five other students standing up at their table, arguing, yelling at the teacher, That I've not Michael, I've never gone by Michael, and my name is Drew. And since I've left high school, though, my name has carried no real significance to me. My name is just Drew. That's what people call me. Uh, The the biggest thing it ever causes issues is is when I'm at Starbucks and they spell my name D-R-U. But otherwise, it's just Drew. It holds nothing, no value to me. I don't ever think about it. Uh, But, and, and, and I think for a lot of people, that's true. Your name is just what people call you. It doesn't hold a lot of significance, but that wasn't always true. Particularly in biblical times, your name meant a great deal. It was how you presented yourself to the world. And it said something about you. It said something about maybe your character or what God you worshiped or, or what you had accomplished. It, it might have told, you, told people your origin story like it did for Moses, drawn out of the water. Your name meant a lot. Names could change as you changed. We see it in the Bible constantly. Saul to Paul, Simon to Peter, Abram to Abraham. Names were an important part of life. And today we're looking at our God's name. What is the name that our God has? Why is he named that? What's the significance about it? What does it tell us about the character of our God? And so today we're going to be going through Exodus 3. We're going to be looking at all 22 verses. And we're going to go ahead and walk through it. And then afterwards we'll come back. We're going to take a look at an in-depth look at his name. 
and what it tells us about him and our relationship to him. So if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Exodus 3, also uh, it's in your, in your program. There should be an insert of uh, the entire chapter if you want to follow along there. And it starts off verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. So this first verse, it just sets the stage for the, the story for this entire chapter of where Moses is, what's going on. It's one of the more famous chapters in the Bible, one of the more famous stories. And it starts off with Moses. He's in Midian. He's a shepherd. And we don't hear it from here, but actually from Acts 7, we know this is now 40 years 40 years from when he flees Egypt, right? He, at age 40, he kills an Egyptian. The Hebrews kind of catch him. He flees 400 miles to Midian where he's at now. He meets the poor and his, his father-in-law. And he's now been there for 40 more years. He's now 80, he's two thirds of the way through his life. And this is when Moses' story really picks up. This is when 80 years in, he receives his call from God. And we find Moses as a shepherd and he's not his like, he's not a shepherd who owns his own flock. He's a shepherd under his father-in-law, Jethro. And if you were paying attention last week, you may notice something. Jethro was not the name that was given to his father-in-law in the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, his father-in-law's name is Reuel, meaning friend of God. And now he has the name Jethro. What has happened is, is his father-in-law's name has either changed from Raul to Jethro or it's expanded. It's Jethro, Raul, or, or some form of that. And it, what scholars believe is that Jethro, which translates to his excellency, excellency, has added to his name. Yes, he's a friend of God, but now because he's the father-in-law to a, a prince of Egypt or a former prince of Egypt, he's some kind of royalty, so what he's doing is he's presenting himself to the world in a different way. He has a title now. He has his excellency and he wants people to know him and, and recognize him as such when they speak of him. And so here's Moses working at his father Jethro. <coughs> and he's working at Mount or at Oreb with his sheep. He's, he's shepherding his sheep in Mount Oreb. Later changes to Mount Sinai as we go further into the Old Testament. It's the same place, different names for the same place. One's very specific space and one's a, a more regional term, but the same mountain that he'll come back to. <coughs> and it's here that Moses is going to have his encounter with God. Verse two says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire <coughs> out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So here's that Moses, he's wandering out in the wilderness with his sheep, minding his own business. And he comes across a flaming bush, but it's, that's, that's, that's on fire, but not really burning. And I I think myself, I know myself, and I, I think a lot of people, we have kind of the uh, uh, misunderstanding or, or misplaced picture of what this looks like. Because for us, we view things through an Americanized mindset, this Western view, right? When I think of a desert, I think of the American West. And, and when I think of a bush in the desert, I'm thinking like a tumbleweed, like this little tiny bush that Moses catches out the corner of his eye. But scholars say the, the bushes of the area would be actually fairly substantial in size, up to 10 feet, 10, 10 feet tall, 10 feet wide. This was a huge spectacle. He would have saw it from afar. It wasn't like God uh, popping up and hoping Moses saw him. God is like broadcasting this giant sign to him through this big burning bush. And it is a spectacle, right? Because it's not just a big bush. It's a big bush that's burning, but not really. I want you to think of this for a second. If the bush is not being consumed, that means it, which is the fuel, supposedly the fuel for the fire, isn't producing ash. It's not crackling and popping. It's not producing smoke. This would have for sure caught Moses' attention and he's going to go see it. He, he's like, what is going on here? And Moses says, verse three, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. Like Moses sees this and he clearly lives in this like pre-TikTok, pre-YouTube age because this is clearly a setup, right? There's a guy gives a pop out after a while from another bush saying, it's just a prank, bro. 
but he steps aside and says, I am going to, I, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Like, who talks like that? And, and beyond that, who is Moses talking to? Like he has clearly been out alone in the sun. He's telling his sheep, hey guys, just wait right here for a second. I'm going to go take a look at this bush. And as he does so, he finally hears a calling. <clears throat> Verse four says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside the sea, God called him to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he, Moses said, here I am. Then he said, that's God again. Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Finally, out of all this, this craziness that's going on, Moses hears a voice and the voice knows his name and he responds. And then the voice gives him two commands. And of course, we, if you've read the story, you know who's calling out to him. It is our God. Uh, but I want you to think about Moses for a second. He doesn't know what's going on. He's come across this massive burning bush that's not really burning. Now he's, uh, someone's calling out his name. He doesn't know who's speaking to him. If it's some spirit, it's a, if it's some person. He's got to be a little bit scared at this point. And then the voice says, hey, take off your shoes. Don't come any closer. And the reason he's telling them this first to not come any closer is that it being God, a perfect creator God, his, Moses' presence in, in, in any closer is incompatible with God. God being perfect and righteous and holy and Moses being uh, sinful by nature, they cannot be in presence of one another. And so God says, stop right where you are. And more than that, you're on holy ground. And it's holy, not because of where he is, but who is there, which is, which is God. And Moses is to show uh, respect and honor of who he is in front of by removing his, frankly, probably disgusting sandals. <coughs> and after Moses <coughs> does this, excuse me, after Moses does this in verse 6, Finally, this voice identifies who he is. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So finally, the voice identifies himself. He says, I am the God. And this word in, in Hebrew is Elohim. It's a directly, we, we translate it to God, but the direct translation is deity. And if you notice how he identifies himself, he doesn't just say, hey, it's God. He has to identify which God, which God is speaking to him, which Elohim is speaking to him, what deity. And he does this by connecting to what Moses would know, the gods of his father, the gods of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He ties it to a story and a people and a covenant that he has with Moses' people. He has to do this because Elohim is, is, we call it the name of God, but it's not really a name. It's more of, it's not who he is. It's more of a what he is. And there are a lot of Elohim. There are a lot of God's present at that time. And I, I, I want to, uh, something I had to wrestle with, it's not just then, but now. The idea of multiple gods is, is, is biblical and something that I think we're, we're trained not to believe. And, and, and it goes back to this word of God. In English, when we say God, we distinct it. Capital G God is our God. And there's no other real other gods. They're just imaginary lowercase g gods, but that's not true. There's, these gods are real in the sense that they are deities and they have some amount of power, but they're not the one true God. They're not the creator. They're not omnipresent and omniscient. They're not, <clears throat> they're not all powerful like he is, but there are plenty of God's deities and they are fallen creations of God who have some amount of power that he allows them to exert. And so God identifies himself to Moses, not as just a God, but which God he is. But this, this isn't his name. He has a, a real name, but he's identifying himself to Moses in the only way that Moses would know how to, to identify with, the Elohim of his people. And Moses' reaction is to hide and it's kind of this reaction that's done for two reasons. One, he has no right to look upon God. 
He recognizes his God. He knows who he is. And he has no choice but to turn away. He does. It's not out of like, uh, it's, it's this fear that is awe and reverence. He turns away out of awe and reverence. But I think, I think what's also going on is Moses is turning away uh, because he's scared in the bad sense. Moses at one point kills an Egyptian in a, in a, in a, in a to, to, to be a rescuer to the Hebrews. And he's rejected by them. He feels like he's rejected by God. He flees to hide. And now his God has found him. He's scared. And God though, God is going to give Moses his calling next. He's going to identify, this is why I'm here, Moses. He says, the Lord said, <laughs> I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God has now identified himself and now he's giving Moses his calling. He says, Moses, I am going to take you and you are going to go back to where you fled from. You are going to take my people and you are going to bring them out of slavery to the land that you have been promised a land that is full of people and, and, and it is sustainable or is, it, is, it could be overflowing with agriculture and livestock. You're his cho- his, he is God's chosen one to, to rescue his people. And Moses, Moses, I love his response because I think he responds like a lot of us when we hear his calling. He's unsure. He's unsure if, if this is really what's supposed to happen for multiple reasons. The first one, he says, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? This is, this is seemingly a really fair question. Moses looks at God, all powerful God, who's just given this calling. And he says, like, who am I to go do this, God? I'm just some shepherd in backwater Midian. You want me to go in front of the most powerful man in the world and tell him, let my people go. Like I got to think in the back of his mind too. He remembers the last time he was there that he's scared that he's going to be found out that he killed somebody. And now he's supposed to go back. And in his mind, the likely things that could happen is best case, he gets laughed out of the city. Worst case, he's put to death. He has no real power to go in front of Pharaoh. And so there's, there's a truth to this question. God, who am I to do so? But there's also, as we'll see as he goes along, this false humility. He doesn't want this calling. He's scared. He's scared. That's why he fled. That's why he's hiding. He wants to stay in Midian. He doesn't want to live out the calling that God has for him. <laughs> and God's answer, I just... I love God's answer because it's, it's how he answers so often in, in both the Old and the New Testament. I love Jesus often does that. He's answered, uh, excuse me, asked the direct question from Moses. Who am I? In God's response, he doesn't really even answer that question. He doesn't answer the question. He says, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. He says just straight to Moses, yeah, it doesn't really matter who you are. It matters that he is God and that he will be with Moses. He gives Moses a God-sized calling and a God-sized promise. And it's not that Moses has no value here. God has been working through him to prepare him for this in two simple ways. I'm sure there's many more when he, when he raises him up in Pharaoh's palace to prepare him to go in front and then to humble him for the last 40 years. He's been working in his life and God says, it doesn't really matter though the rest of your qualifications. You may be underqualified, but God is overqualified. And if you have God, Whatever insufficiencies you have, God is more than sufficient. And it's the same truth that Moses has that we have. When we receive a calling of God, 
Yes, it's important how God has been working in our lives, but more than that, it's important that God is with us. Moses and us, we have to take our eyes off of ourselves and raise them to God, the one who has given the calling. <laughs> and Moses, or oh, excuse me, out of that, God gives Moses this kind of like promise that, hey, here's the deal. You give me some faith, you trust in me, and I'm going to show you along the way in getting to the promised land that I am who I say I am. I will bring you and your people, my people, back to this mountain where you will worship me. He goes on verse 13. Then Moses said to God, his questioning continues. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And this again, yes, Moses is trying to get out of it. But again, a very fair question. If Moses is going to return to the, the Hebrew people, the Israelites and say, hey, the God of your fathers has sent me. What does that really mean to them? He's going to say the Elohim of your fathers. And again, like I said, there's, there's a lot of Elohim. That doesn't really do much. Anybody at any time could walk up to anybody and say, hey, the Elohim of your father sent me. And I think if somebody did that today, they get the same response. Oh, you're crazy, Moses. You don't know me. You don't know anything about us. And so he's asking them, how do I actually identify you to them? And God said to Moses, and this is it. This is, he's finally going to give Moses and the Hebrew people his name. And this is important because up to this point, as far as we know, at least in recorded history, they don't have God's name. They call him Elohim of, or they call him, the name they might, uh, had at the time was El Shaddai, literally God of the mountain or God Almighty. <clears throat> but they don't have his actual name. And God's just going to hand it to him. He's going to hand it to Moses. And this is substantial because at the time, the gods, particularly of Egypt, they had this idea that they had um, a secret name. And if you knew their name, you had control over them. And God just says, hey, Moses, here, you can have my name. I'm not worried if you know my real name because you can't have any control over me. No one can. <laughs> In verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And that's just cool, right? Like, God's got a flair for the dramatic. I, I get asked who I am, and I get to say true. God gets to say, I am who I am. And I would like you to underline that. We're going to come back to this. He continues on, and he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Uh, midway through verse 15, it says the Lord. I'd like you to underline that. And if you notice something about that, <clears throat> it's all capitalized letters. Uh, this is not something we do in the English language. This is done a very specific reason. It's not an abbreviation. It's a substitute for God's name. And, and God is not God's name Lord is not God's name. His name is represented by this. We'll come back to this. <clears throat> but God has delivered his name to Moses. And then he's going to finish his conversation. He's going to give to Moses really a fuller picture of the next part of his plan. He says, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me. <clears throat> saying, I have observed you and what you has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice and you are the elders of Israel should go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand <coughs> and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall go, not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. And so God 
paints this bigger picture of what the next steps of his journey is going to look like. He says, you're not just going to go bring my people to the promised land. You're going to go ahead. You're going to go the 400 miles back to Egypt. You're going to meet with the Hebrew people. You're going to identify who I am by using my real name. Then the, you and them, the elders, are going to go in front of Pharaoh. You're going to tell him, let my people go. And they're going to say, or excuse me, he's going to say, no. And out of that, God is going to reveal his power, his might in front of the mightiest nation on earth and in front of all of their gods and show basically that they hold no power over him. And then finally, Pharaoh will let his people go. But as they leave, they're going to plunder the Egyptians. They're going to just willingly be handed over uh, <coughs> jewelry, gold and silver jewelry for them to take with them. And so finally, we're going to get this, this name of God. We're going to see that God is the I am. And he reveals this to Moses in verse 14 and 15. He said, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is, and again, this is, this explains his name. It's not the name that we're going to use. Uh, and he goes on to say, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And God also said this to Moses. Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord and this is where his name is. And it's not Lord. Uh, when we see this Lord, these, these four letters capitalized L-O-R-D, it's not a direct translation from Lord. Whenever we see the lowercase Lord, it's Adonai. Uh, and this uppercase Lord is taking the place of the word Yahweh. Uh, at least that's how we uh, believe it's pronunciated. We're not exactly sure. Uh, in uh, direct translation from Hebrew, it would be Y-H-W-H. It's called a tetragrammaton. Excuse me, tetragrammaton. Literally, uh, the Greek translation is the four letters. And we don't actually know how it's pronounced because the, the, the original pronunciation was lost in the writing. They have a good idea that it's Yahweh. Uh, sometimes it's pronounced over the years Jehovah based on a, a misunder what is likely a misunderstanding. Uh, and this goes back to the original writing of Hebrew didn't have vowels. And so we're not 100% sure Yahweh is likely the, the, the name of God. And it's written, Lord, I had this question, why would they write it, Lord? Why not Yahweh? It goes back to about 350 BC. Uh, the Jews had decided the strict interpretation of the Ten Commandments, thou should not take the Lord's name in vain. And they took that and said, if we're not going to take his Lord's name in vain, we're not even going to say his name. We're not going to say it anymore because then you might accidentally use it. And that tradition has been carried on as into the English translation where it's capital L-O-R-D. But God has a name and it's Yahweh. And what's really cool is, is all that it means. And that's what we want to cover. What is this? Why is this substantial? What does the name Yahweh mean to us? What does that reveal about God? If God is the I am, what does that say? And there's really uh, several things that I want to cover Several things, this isn't in the entirety of his name, but several things that really stood out to me that are helpful. The first is that he is self-existent. When he says Yahweh, he's coming out of this, I am, I am who I am. That's how when he first reveals his name. Uh, and the best understanding of why does it go from I am to Yahweh, it's uh, when he says I am who I am, it's Eye Eser Eye. That literally, I exist unto which I exist. And then he gets to Yahweh, if you caught on to it. Aye, Yahweh. The best explanation I had this play on words is it goes from I am, God referring to himself, to he is, the way we refer to God. But it reveals that he is self-existent. I am who I am, literally translated to, I exist unto which I exist. See, names, as I shared, they, they, they pointed to something, pointed to a character quality or an origin story. And God says, I don't, my name doesn't point me back to anything. This is a really important thing at the time where the Egyptian gods, uh, Ra or Anubis, their names are directly pointing to the power they hold, power over the sun, power over death. And God says, my name only points back to myself. God in all his power, he, he's, he's not defined by anything else other than himself. He is not a part of creation. He created everything. Nothing holds power over him. He holds power over all things. And so it's, he is self-existent. And out of this, what's really cool, it just flows right out of this. 
is that uh, this idea that I would like us to carry through the rest of this, of this sermon series. And it's that his character is defined by him. This is this kind of meta idea that, that's a little bit hard to wrap my head around, or, but I, I think I got it fully. Is that his, the characters that we are ascribing to God, they don't define him, he defines them. And if you're kind of scratching your head, I want you to stay with me for a second. All right, so we've gone two weeks, or this is week three, we've gone two weeks. The first week we talked about this idea that God is sovereign, which is true. But sovereignty doesn't describe God. Sovereignty exists because God has modeled it for us. We understand sovereignty in its perfection because God has shown it. He didn't become sovereign. He didn't work on being sovereign. It's not something that, he has always been sovereign. And last week, we, Craig talked about God being compassionate. The same idea is true. Compassion, yes, is something that he, he exhibits, but we understand compassion because he is compassionate. He gave us the perfect model of compassion. He defines it. We know compassion because of God. And as we go through the series and all the different characteristics, we're going to say who our God is it's a thing to remember that he didn't grow in these. He didn't come to be these things. He didn't change over the years to these things. He defines them. We know them because he lived them out for us. The next thing I see is this idea <laughs> that God is unchanging. He is an unchanging God. His name, Yahweh, and he points back when he reveals himself, I am who I am, uh, doesn't paint the full picture in English. In English, we have different words for past, present, future. In Hebrew, they don't have different words for past, present, and future. You have to determine it from the context of, the, of, uh, of what, the rest of what's being said. So when he says, I am who I am, uh, that doesn't capture it. What he's really in essence saying is, I have been and I am and I will be who I have been and who I am and who I will be. God is an unchanging God. And so those qualities that he's, and he's sovereign, he's always been sovereign and he always will be sovereign. He's always been compassionate and he always will be compassionate or patient or loving or whatever qualities we're going to give him. He has always been those things. He is always those things and he will always be those things. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. I think for a lot of people, they look, I hear this a lot. They look at the two, the Old Testament and the New Testament and say, man, God's really changed over the years. He's not the same God. The old God's mean. The new God's nice. The old version of God is, is, is wrathful. The new version of God's compassionate. And the, but the truth is God is unchanging. He may have all those qualities, but he hasn't changed over time. He's not fickle like the gods of, of mythology that are, that are pushed in, and redirected by whatever's going on around them. He has been and he always will be who he is. There's one last thing that I want to talk about that's, that, that's really important is how does his name have impact in, for us today? That the I am, uh, it really gets confused. The name Yahweh uh, can really be misused because we attribute it to something uh, that it's not in its fullness. What I mean by that is when we're saying this, this sermon series, our God is when, when I hear God, a lot of the times I know when people have told me and what I've heard, when they hear the word God, they often look straight to the idea of the father and the father is God, but he's one part of the Trinity. We have a triune God, three persons in one. And all the characteristics that we're assigning, we're not just assigning them to the father, we're assigning them to the fullness of God. And so I wanted to jump to John 8, 58 and 59. And it's, it's a conversation that Jesus is having with the Pharisees. And it's a heated conversation like they often are. Jesus has been going on for a while. He eventually calls them and tells, or calls that them out and says, hey, you guys are of the devil. You're not of the father. And they, they're upset. They, they, start, they start just going at each other. And this conversation eventually leads to a place where Jesus says in essence, hey, yeah, I was around to see Abraham. And the Pharisees, they catch on to this. They're like, wait a second, you were, allowed, you were around to see Abraham? You're not even 50 years old, Jesus. He's been dead and gone for a long, long time. And they make note of, they want everybody to hear this. 
Because Jesus now sounds like a madman. How could you be alive for, for these many, how could you be alive for 30-ish years and know Abraham? And Jesus' response, though, is going to reveal the fullness. It's, it's really the most compelling argument that Jesus makes to his divinity. He says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus, in this statement, he says to the Pharisees and everyone who he says, he says, I am Yahweh. He says it just straight up. He is God in the flesh. In essence, he says, yeah, I saw Abraham. I saw everything before that too. I was around during creation. Time is not, it doesn't matter to me. I, I've seen everything that has ever existed. He has made his claim, his stake, that he is in fact God on earth. And, and, and the Pharisees, they know exactly what he's saying. The law demands that they put him to death. That's why they pick up stones to throw at him. And I want us to, to be aware of this as we're going through this sermon series that what we're attributing to God, we're not just attributing to the Father, we're attributing to Jesus. So when we say God is sovereign, Jesus is sovereign. When we say God is compassionate, Jesus is compassionate and unchanging in, in, in everything we're going to go through. And I kind of want to end on this, this idea that Jesus is God. And, and I want to give people here an opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity to really wrestle with. Some of you here, you're all in your body and your followers of Christ. And some of you today, you're here really wrestling. What do I do with Jesus? And I hear the generations, my generation, millennials, Gen Z, I hear this idea a lot. Jesus was a really good guy with some really good teaching. But beyond that, he doesn't really hold any importance. But just buying into the principles of God without God isn't enough. It's not enough yet. It's insufficient. What he wants isn't you just to follow his ideals, but to, but to have a relationship with your God. And so some of you are here really, the question you really need to answer is, who is Jesus to you? Is he just another guy? Or is he who he says he is? Which is God in the flesh. And if you're wrestling with that today, you want to know more, I would love for you to come up at the end of service. Your campus pastors, they would love to share more of this with you. But you have to wrestle with the idea. Is, is Jesus a guy with some really good ideas, but a madman who claims he's God? Or is he who he says he is? I'm going to release the campus pastors. I love you guys. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around today. Our transformational moment is just some reflection on this, this idea, this statement. Because God is the I am, I can. What? What, is that, what does that really mean to you? We, a lot of times we give you really this answer to this question, a really specific thing to think about. But today we just wanted to give you an, this, this thought. Because God is the I am, I can, or I can live like, or I can be something what does God being the I am mean for you? Thank you guys. Have a great day.